why don't we all stand as we begin to get ready to lift our voices in praise. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Good morning, church. What a beautiful day we have today, man. I'm going to say no more snow. I'm declaring it today, no more snow. <laughs> or you may be seated. Amen. Well, we just want to welcome everyone, everyone here this morning. And if you're a first-time guest today, we welcome you as well. We're so happy you're here with us today. Amen. My name is Yobaida Cruz. And my name is Eduardo Cruz. <laughs> and like my husband said, on behalf of Parkway Church, we just want to welcome all of our guests here this morning. Uh, we know that God has something very special for you here today. And uh, when we welcome you, it's really a genuine welcome. Uh, we really want you to feel um, 
like this is a place where you can grow, where you can meet other people, and you can have what you are looking for in your relationship with Christ. If you're a first time guest in the pew before you, there is a connect card. If you can please fill that card out and meet us in the back by guest services at the end of the service, we wanna meet you. We wanna give you a gift. And uh, we just want to give you more information on what Parkway has to offer for you. If you're a second-time guest, please also fill out that Connect card or place it in the offering basket when it comes around. Amen. Well, let's pray for today's service. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord God. We're, we're so excited, Lord God, just to be here in your presence, Lord God. We come here with great anticipation, Lord God. All our praise is to you, Lord Father. I ask you to just bless each one that has a part of this service, all our guests, Lord God. We just give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I'm the video. My heart ran wild and I followed close To mercy broke down my every wall I chased this world wandering aimlessly You show me look like I never seen Nothing can replace this feeling Higher and higher I lift your praise Good morning and welcome to the weekly Parkway Church video update. My name is Ty and I will be giving you a look at everything happening right here at Parkway Church. Tonight there will be a 6 o'clock service in the sanctuary. There's child care available for infants through age 4, junior rangers for children between the ages of 5 and 11, and Anthem Youth Ministries for young people between the ages of 12 and 18. We also want you to know that there will be no ladies prayer this coming Saturday. The next time you will meet for prayer will be Saturday, June 8th in the sanctuary for church family prayer. That will be taking place at 8.30 a.m. Hi, I'm Chris Newman and I'm the coach of Kids Parkway. I'm here to let you know that the forms for Wisconsin District Junior Camp are now available at the Happenings Wall. Forms are for staff and campers and need to be turned in by May 15th. Camp will be from June 17th to the 21st. You can turn these forms in to me directly or you can put them in my mailbox just outside of the check-in desk at Kids Parkway. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Next Sunday, we will be celebrating Mother's Day here at Parkway Church. There will be a 10 a.m. service honoring all of the moms here at Parkway, and we encourage you to bring your favorite mom to that service. There will be no 6 p.m. service next Sunday night, and we encourage you to spend the day with family and friends. Looking ahead to June 30th, we will be honoring all of our graduates. Graduates from high school, college, or the Purpose Institute four-year program will be honored that day. The graduate must be an active member of Parkway Church and they must be in attendance at the June 30th morning service in order to receive recognition. Please email your graduate's name and school to for you at parkwayoc.com by June 2nd in order for them to be on the list. We are very excited to be having a vacation Bible school right here at Parkway Church this summer from July 8th through July 12th. It will be for children between the ages of 5 and 11 years old and there is no cost for registration. For more information about VBS, you can see your 411 information sheet. As always, if you have any questions about anything that we've announced, you can pick up a 411 information sheet, stop by the Parkway Happenings Wall, or visit us online at www.parkwayoc.com. Now please enjoy this service. Hey Amen. Why don't we all stand as we begin to worship?
you did God hallelujah
darkness is in your life, whatever fear is in your life, the name of Jesus makes the darkness tremble. The name of Jesus silences your fears. Won't you say the name of Jesus over your situation? You might think that's silly. I don't think it's silly because there is power in the name of Jesus. Just saying the name Jesus can cause demons to tremble. It can cause chains to break. It can cause sickness to be healed. Won't you speak the name of Jesus in your life right now? Find somebody and speak the name of Jesus over their life. You don't know who needs to hear it. I don't know who needs to hear it, but we're going to say it together. We're going to say the name of Jesus because at the name of Jesus, we know that every knee will bow. We know that there is salvation in the name of Jesus. We know that there is power in the name of Jesus. Won't you say it over your situation right now with us? Jesus, Jesus.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Let's give God a minute here. He's pouring out his spirit right here for this young man. So let's give him a minute. Jesus. you go in the prayer room. Take him in the prayer room, the men's prayer room. Amen. 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 What a beautiful spirit here this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your spirit. Yes, God. Yes, God. You can make your way back to your seats and we're going to transition to the next part of our service. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Before we go into that, though, I think someone had a birthday this week. You don't want to... If you could see Sister Melissa's face right now. <laughs> Here, hold on, hold on to him a second. But um, if you could present her with the flowers, but we're going to sing happy birthday. You don't want me to sing, though, I guarantee it. Ricky? Ricky. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day of the year. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you, and the best you've ever had. I, I will not make you come up here if you don't want to. Would you like to greet the congregation, Sister Melissa? Thank you, everybody, for the birthday wishes all week. Um, I truly felt special. Um, to all the text messages, FaceTimes that I got, and I just, I love you all, and thank you. Amen. Amen. So as we go, this is our IF Sunday, which is Faith Initiative. So we wanted to give you a little bit of an update on where we stand right now. So far, you have given $98,607. Praise God. Which is 55% of the total goal, which is outstanding. It is absolutely outstanding. Let me just, let me just give you a little testimony to show you how God works. Brother Don Malice, who takes care of these, all of the facilities and does, in, does an outstanding job doing that, <clears throat> has, been, has been on the carpet manufacturer of all the carpet in the foyer and in the back, all the carpet tiles, saying it's never been right since it's put in. How long ago, Don, was that? Six years ago? About six years ago, maybe, or so. And... Um, so finally this week, he came and I uh, was talking to him and he said the manufacturer is going to replace all the carpet free of charge, no cost to the church. <laughs> See, when we take care of what God wants us to do and we're faithful in our tithes and our giving and giving out money to missionaries and taking care of those outside of the church, God will always take care of his kids. That's the promises in scripture. All we have to do is be faithful. Isn't that easy for us to do? Amen. Amen. Also, one other thing. This is the 47th anniversary of this church. Amen. And, you know, for... I've been around here a little while, and... Um, 
The, uh, the history of this church is tremendous. From a, from a small congregation in a home in South Milwaukee with, with borrowed chairs to see what God has done in 47 years. What a testimony. And a lot of you, a lot of you probably don't know, but the living room area, which we call a living room now, which is across from the, the coffee shop, was the first church. You say, really? Yeah, that was the first church. And all over the years, those 47 years, God is, is just blessed and poured out his blessings on this church and, and you because of all of your faithfulness. So there, we have a lot to be thankful for, folks. We really do, and God's blessings. Um, the if, some of you may not know, but if is the way that we give out to missionaries, to uh, benevolence, and that's the way we collect funds. So you'll notice in the church, we do no fundraising. Other than our normal tithes and offerings, you won't see us selling candy bars and doing all those things that a lot of other churches do. But we do it once a year when we do pledges. And there's pledge cards in the back if you haven't gotten on board with this. But I really encourage you to get involved because God will truly open up the windows of heaven and pour out the blessings in your life if you're faithful to him, okay? Ushers, if you'd come, please. You know, being around here so long, I've had the, uh, the opportunity to see the blessings that God does for us, you know. But one thing is I never want to take them for granted. Never, ever do I want to. Do I expect it? No. But by faith, we can claim it. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your spirit this morning. What a wonderful place. What a wonderful spirit it is in here today, Lord God. Lord, as we unite together, Lord God, I pray, God, that you would use Pastor to deliver the word, Lord, and that you would fill many with your spirit this morning, Lord God. Lord, as uh, people give in the offering today, and for those who can't give, I pray, I pray God, that you would bless them. You know, let us be sensitive, Lord, to those around us, Lord God. Lord, and we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for the blessings that you've poured out upon this congregation. I pray, God, that you'd bless each one for being here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. We're going to lift our voice in victory. We're going to make your praises loud. The enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. We're going to lift our voice in victory. We're going to make your praises loud. The enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. We're going to lift our voice in victory. We're going to make your praises loud. The enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. We're going to lift our voice in victory. We're going to make your praises loud. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Shout out to God with a voice of praise. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Shout out to God with a voice of praise. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Shout out to God with a voice of praise. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Shout out to God with a voice of praise. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Shout out to God with a voice of praise. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Shout out to God with a voice of praise. Shout out to God with a voice of Give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. He's worthy. God, we worship you. We exalt you. We magnify you. There is no one like you. There's never been anyone before you. No one will be after you. You reign supreme, eternal, immortal. You are the only God. We exalt you. We praise you. I couldn't help but think as we were singing the song Tremble, as I believe the title of the song. And as we were singing the name and we began to listen and we began to be exhorted about the fact that it's at the name of Jesus that the enemy trembles. But can I just for a moment give you just a little more clarity on that? You see, the enemy has, wow, that's awesome. The enemy has an understanding. He has a revelation of who Jesus is. There's no doubt in his mind who he is. He doesn't think that he's a good man. He doesn't think he's just some prophet. He doesn't think he's just some man who did some miracles and now there's millions and billions of people that have professed faith in him. Oh, see, he recognizes that the Jesus that I serve, that the Jesus that lives within me is God. Now, let me just help you with something, okay? I, I just, I feel like sometimes we, we forget. The Bible says that if we resist the enemy, He'll flee. If he will tremble, 
having an understanding of the revelation who Jesus is, let me explain to you why he trembles. It's not because he knows that Jesus is God. He trembles at the fact that he's afraid you're going to figure out that Jesus is God. He trembles at the fact that you're going to get a revelation of the power and the authority and the dominion that you have when you speak the name. You see, it's in the situation when you plead the name, when you call out to the name, that he will flee. He's not trembling because you say Jesus. He's fleeing when you say Jesus. He's trembling because you have an understanding of the power in the name. And so I would tell you, I would just say this to you. I don't, it doesn't matter if it's a sickness. It doesn't matter if it's a temptation. Can I just promise you, you try this the next time. You, you try this the next time you're tempted with evil. Okay, let, let me just break it down a little bit here. I'm feeling spunky this morning. The next time you're tempted in a group setting with folks and somebody says, hey, would you like a bud, bud? I dare you to just say, Jesus, I'll bet. I'll just bet. They say, yeah, never mind. And I'll bet they never ask you again. I'll bet, I'll bet the next time you're hiding in private in your home somewhere. Oh, I'm going to get ugly here. You're hiding in private somewhere, and the family's in some other part of the house, and all of a sudden that website comes up. I dare you to scream Jesus. You see, the devil's not trembling because you have an understanding and that you might say something. No, see, what he's trembling is if you actually get to the fact that you put the name in action in your life, he's going to have to run because I guarantee you if you're doing what you ought not be doing and you yell, Jesus, there's going to be a whole lot of people come running to find out what happened and you're going to be like, I got to get off, I got to get off. So I just say this to you, whatever the situation, whatever it is, just start hollering Jesus. You know, we used to be called Jesus freaks. And it was because our conversation was always about him. Now, for some reason today, I'm preaching and I'm not even in my mess. We, we used to have all manner of conversation and communication about the Lord. Everything that we did, they said, is that all you ever talk about? Is that all your life is? But for some reason today, we want to walk into a conversation and talk about a whole bunch of foolishness. And we say it's so that they'll feel comfortable when the reality is it's so my carnality will feel comfortable. Well, anyway. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 32, and then I'm going to read Acts 28 and verse 27, and I'm going to, I'm going to preach a message today. But before I jump into that, uh, I'm not going to preach my second sermon. Uh, I am going to honor my wife this morning as well. Uh, I, and you don't have to clap for this, um, but I will just say this to you. Men, if you have a wife that will pray for you, if you have a spouse who will pray in tongues for you, you ought to appreciate her. And if she don't, don't suck your thumb about it. Maybe be a husband that will pray for her and pray in tongues over her. Mm, I need to be careful. But baby, I love you. I'm proud of you. I am not me without you. And this church is, is uh, better because of you. They would be in miserable shape if it was just me. So thank you for being the softness and the gentleness and the sweetness to all of my vinegar and my rough edges. So... We love you. Uh, Luke, the 24th chapter, Scripture reads this way. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the Scriptures? Acts 28, verse 27 from the Amplified. 
For the heart, the understanding, the soul of this people has become dull, has become calloused. In other words, their understanding, the very essence of who they are has become calloused. It's become resistant to the spirit, to the presence, to the understanding of God. And with their ears, they scarcely hear. And they have shut their eyes to the truth. Otherwise, or you might say, if this was not the case, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return to me. And I would heal them. This morning, my title is taken from your journal that you will be getting into beginning tomorrow. And the title is simply Hearts on Fire. We are moving from Calvary to from the resurrection to this period of waiting about to begin the pursuit or the moving, if you will, toward the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Spirit. So this morning, I'm going to deal with this topic, hearts on fire. Let's pray together one more time. Gracious Father, we love you and we thank you for your faithfulness to us. You today. And we thank you for, for being in this place, for being in this house. Where would we be without you? Today, God, we, we most certainly need and have, we have a desire that you would be with us, that you would come and you would minister, that you would have your liberty amongst us. Or this morning, we have an understanding. We have the revelation. We know who you are. We know that you have come. We know that you have filled us with your spirit. And so we, we represent you in everything that we do. But today, I pray, God, especially that you would bring to us a fresh revelation that we would be reminded Lord, of the power that we have in right relationship with you. That we would have a revelation today of what it is that you called us to, of what you have redeemed us from and what you have commissioned us to. I pray for every guest that's in the house this morning, Lord, that they would feel your love, that they would feel welcomed by this family, that they would know that they've come home and that you are here to love them, to bless them. I pray, oh God, that there would be a moving of your spirit among us this morning, that we would be restored, we would be reconciled to you, and that those that have not yet been baptized in the name of Jesus, that have not been filled with your spirit, that today, that their faith would be strengthened, that they might receive from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated this morning. Just wave at me if you have too much difficulties and you want me to go back, I'll go back, I promise. Okay. A couple of weeks ago, I delivered to you the what would be considered the culmination or the crescendo of Christ's passion with the message entitled Total Triumph. We were reminded of the total and complete victory that Christ secured on that resurrection day. On that resurrection morning, we were reminded that he had come out of that tomb with all power and all authority. He was alive forevermore, and nothing could diminish his power nor debate his authority. He had secured our liberty from death and from hell. He secured the possibility of no one ever needing to miss heaven as their home. We were given the revelation of a risen Savior and the eternal hope for our lives. But this morning, for just a little bit this morning, I want to go back, if you don't mind, to that third day. The day we celebrated and live yet today in its promise of life everlasting filled with 
joy, and with peace. I want to go all the way back some 2,000 plus years ago and join ourselves to a journey and conversation of two disciples making their way to the city of Emmaus. For I believe it is within their experience that we will find a similarity that oftentimes many of us are experiencing in our present lives. So it's here in the 24th chapter of the book of Luke that we find the account of these two believers making their way along the road to Emmaus, a city that scripture gives us that was some seven miles from Jerusalem nearly. We do not know much about these two other than they were obviously believers, they were disciples, and one was a man by the name of Cleophas. And as it has been debated by the commentators that it was two men walking along. It, was, it has been debated that it was Cleophas and his wife who is mentioned to be near the Lord at the time of his crucifixion. It would seem, though, that whoever it was with Cleophas, that this was a time of great sadness for these two as they traveled discussing the recent events and what would appear to be the unfulfilled dreams and promise of the one that they called, that they knew as the Messiah. Their hearts were filled with discouragement and their minds were perplexed for the one they believed to be the Messiah, the Savior, the Restorer, Jesus, the Son of the living God, was dead. Yet there was that very morning that very day, as they are discussing, they are discussing the stories that they had heard about the women who went to the tomb only to find that the body they went to prepare for burial was gone. These same women said that they saw a vision of men or of angels who said that Christ had risen and even that one of them had seen him and spoken to him. What were they to believe? What were they to believe? The questions and perplexities that are confronting these two believers are in many ways the same things confronting us in our own personal challenges and situations. We face the questions and the challenge of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a believer, what it looks like to be this, what does it mean when I say that I am following Christ? What does it mean that I trust him? What does it mean when I say that I believe in him? Do I really believe? Do I really believe this morning that he is who he said he is? Do I believe who he said he is? And what does this look like? today. How am I following Christ today? Am I simply trying to live a good life and looking to avoid doing wrong things just so as not to break any of the rules, whether they be biblical rules or rules imposed by some system of religion? Are we trying to live what we think or have been told is the lifestyle of a believer, of a Christian, or have our lives been truly transformed by a powerful, a miraculous, a personal encounter with Jesus Christ? This is what takes place in the lives of these two believers as they are traveling the road to Emmaus. Their lives are about to be forever transformed by this encounter with Christ. It's an encounter that today that I'm praying that every day going forward that this transformation, that this encounter would happen to us beginning this morning and forever transform our lives in all of our tomorrows. An encounter with Christ that will no longer allow us to say, I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. But our lives show that this means seemingly 
nothing more than simply leading a morally restrained life where I restrict myself from doing bad things. The scripture talks about people who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Now that scripture's been used in context, out of context, around the context, in all kinds of ways. But there is a lot of us that profess to be something with our mouths. But our lives exemplify something entirely different. Well, you don't have to believe me. Some of you do, but it, it just bothers me. Now, I'm a generally positive person. My wife says that in the mornings I'm probably too positive and too filled with joy because I'll get out of bed and I'll have a song in my heart. Go figure, right? I'll have a song in my heart. And I'll sing. And I'll bother everybody. My daughter is so thankful that she has her driver's license. I don't know if she's in here this morning. Maybe she's probably hoping she's in Sunday school. But she's probably glad she has her driver's license and she can drive herself to school by herself because on the way to school, I would read Bible scriptures. You know, I'd be quoting them. I'd sing a song. I'd be poking her. You ready to have a good day? Why ain't you happy? You grumpy today? And she's thinking, I want to knock you out. But I believe that if I am going to be a Christ follower, that I ought to be able to go into whatever the situations are that come into my life, now, please, I'm not, I am not saying that we always are going to walk around acting like nothing's wrong and we're going to live in a state of denial. But dear God, if all I ever do is suck my thumb and moan about my issues, ain't nobody wanting to be around me. But at some point, if I say I'm a Christ follower, I'm a king's kid, right? I mean, I could go through the lifts and stir you up this morning. But at some point within that, I need to begin to remind myself who I am and say, well, then maybe it's possible that I'm here by God's design. And I might not like it, and that might be a good thing. That this might be uncomfortable, and it's causing me to think, well, if something don't change, I'm going to have to change. Well, hello. I better get back in my notes. I'm sorry. But we should have this kind of encounter with God that changes not just our speech, but the very manner of our lifestyle. And please hear me this morning for all of you that just went into full freakout mode. I'm not telling you that I'm going to stand up here next week and give you a whole list of laundry items that I think you ought to stop and start doing. But really, to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ the spirit within you ought to begin to dictate things within you that you say, i got to make some adjustments. So it has to be more than me just saying, I'm going to live a good life, a wholesome life. There's a whole lot of good people that are going to go to hell. Sorry, because it's not by works that I have done. My righteousness or my good living is as filthy rags. It says a dung heap to God. He don't care about that. He wants to know, have I been born again? Have I been born into the family? So it should not mean that as a Christ follower, as a believer, I am simply, you. should I switch? Is this really, is my microphone? So having this, encounter with Christ should not just simply cause me to say that I am a disciple of Christ, a Christ follower, a believer, and, and so I make some conscious decisions and try to live a restrained life, but rather that I might live a life that shows a transformation that has come from a supernatural encounter with the Almighty God that allowed me this moment, this opportunity to have spiritual new birth where I am, and watch this, this is awesome, these kind, these phrases in scripture light me up every time, where I am not one, the one I used to be, where I'm no longer who I once was, that the things that I once did 
and the things that I loved, I now hate those things. But the things that I didn't really care for so much before, now I love at them and I ascribe them to my life. It has changed everything about me to where the scripture can testify of my life that the old things have passed away and all things have become new. I'm here to tell you this morning, if you are in relationship with God, honest and complete relationship where you have had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, you will be changed. You will go to the job tomorrow and people are going to say, what's different about you? How come your language is changing? Oh, you're too good to go out with us now. Oh, trust me, I've heard it. And they'll look to find ways to make you seem like a hoity-toity, right? Oh, holier than thou. You think you're better than everybody else. Nope. I just realized and recognized how miserable I was before Christ. And you've got to be careful who you say this to, but you don't like it because I'm causing you to recognize it in your own life. See, what happens is, is when God begins to do the work in our life as a result of an encounter with him, we become a mirror in the lives of other people. And when we walk in being what we once were, but now being something different, being transformed by the spirit, all of a sudden they begin to look into our lives and they say, "Uh oh, something's different. They may not understand what it is. They may not understand why they feel that way. But what they do realize is they're uncomfortable. And so there's a problem. They don't like it. And they need to push it away. So I must, if I have an encounter with God, there must be a change that comes to my life. So these two believers, these two people are walking along the road on the way to Emmaus. And they're discussing these recent events. And maybe, just maybe, they were remembering when they saw Jesus perform one of his many miracles. Maybe they were there when John the Baptist stood and declared here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Maybe they were remembering the times where with just a spoken word, the sick were healed or the dead raised back to life or the demonic, the, the, the individual that was possessed of a demonic spirit was now liberated by the spoken word of the Almighty. Maybe they were remembering all the times they traveled in the way with Christ and he would share great revelation with them from the scriptures. Or maybe they were, as we read, talking about the events of that day day an empty tomb his body missing stories of him being risen to life here is what we do know no matter their conversation no matter what it was they were discussing it is at that moment that we find Christ joining himself to them verse 15 is where Christ comes and makes this connection and the Bible says that as they were discussing these events, these happenings, that Christ joins them, but their eyes were unable, or the scripture says, prevented from seeing him. They were not able to recognize that God himself had just joined their journey. Jesus is with them, but they don't recognize him. Jesus is with them, but they don't perceive that it's him. How many times does this happen to us? How many times is it that the Lord would come to us, but we don't realize his presence has entered our space? How often do we find ourselves in a trial or a difficult situation and find it hard to imagine that the Lord is actually with us? How many times is it that it's not even about whether or not we have faith in God, but rather it's about that we didn't even consider him in our trial or our difficult situation. And as a result, we find it hard to imagine that he's actually even with us. How many times? How many times in the situation is it not that my faith is weak or absent? but that I don't even take the time to consider him within what I'm going through. We just do not 
or have not thought about it. Is it possible here in this account of these two travelers that the Lord allowed their eyes to not recognize him so that the truth might be revealed to them? That the condition of their hearts would be made known that there might be a transformation in their very lives to help them remember what they had been taught and what they had believed. This to me is such a beautiful story of the compassion of Christ, the compassion of our God, in that he joins their journey. And Luke makes record that as he's walking with them, that he makes reference to their sad countenance. He makes reference to their disposition. I'm thankful this morning that I serve a God who can be touched by the very feelings of my infirmities, by the things that I'm struggling with, he can be touched. He can be moved with compassion by the things that I'm going through. I'm thankful to know that he's promised never to leave me. But I wonder sometimes if I forget about that promise. I'm thankful that he promised never to forsake me. But I feel like an idiot because there's many times that I don't even consider the fact that I'm not by myself in my trial, that he said he would never leave me nor forsake me, so he must be here somewhere. I'm thankful that I understand that he makes the promise that the good work that he began in me, he's also faithful to finish or to complete. Therefore, in the midst of my struggle, God is drawing, God is working, and he is that ever-present help. He is available to me. So Christ asked them why they seem sad. And, and, and if you were to read this story, and you should, they, they seem almost flabbergasted that he does not know what has transpired and how Christ had brutally suffered and died and now how even his very body was missing. And we are very quick to judge them and I would say too negatively, uh, too harshly, having some 2,000 years of clarity after the fact. But many of us here today are found within the representation of these two believers. How many come to Christ realizing that they need a better life? How many come to Christ realizing there's got to be a better way, a better plan? How many come looking for a goal of something that will change their life? Ah, but really the goal is about their personal, their ultimate, personal happiness and satisfaction. You see, this morning, this is not the gospel. The gospel is not about what you and I want. It's about what Christ gives. You see, the, the thinking that it's, um, it's about my life after I come to Christ is forever transformed, which means now I have enough money in my pocket all the time. I can have all the stuff I want. I'll never have any problems. I'll never go through anything. That's foolishness. That's me pushing my ideas onto what God would do. It's never been about personal gain. It's always been about total life transformation. I say, God, help us have a revelation of truth that we would not be satisfied without this transformation within our lives, that we would not be satisfied with simply the blessings and favor of God on our life, but we would say, God, do the work that you've desired to do in me. Finish the work that you began in me. God does, though, understand, come to bless and give things to his people. His children he comes to uphold and to strengthen, and he's made great promises to his children. But it has never been simply about the gifts. It's always been about the transformation. It's always been about this. It's always been about seeking and saving the lost. Taking that which was dead and restoring it to life. Not simply physical life, but spiritual life. So we find these two that day, they're looking at things in the natural. They're looking at the physical representation of things as 
many had undoubtedly that day. They were looking for a restoration of the physical kingdom of God being restored, not the spiritual kingdom of God. And we preach and teach the same message of life transformation, but then in the midst of our troubles and trials, it would seem that our lives would join to these two individuals who needed transformation in their understanding. You see, Christ came, his goal was to seek and to save that which was lost and gave us as his people, as the redeemed, a commission to do the same. We as the church, as the body of Christ, have been redeemed and commissioned. Please understand that today. You have not just been redeemed. You have not just been saved from the, the damnation of hell. You have been redeemed unto life and commissioned with a purpose. Your purpose and commission is to do the will of the Father. To seek and to save that which was lost. We have been commissioned to reach a lost and dying world with a message not of prosperity, not of easy believism, but rather we have been given a commission to go into all the world preaching the kingdom of God is at hand and that life eternal can be found rather than a place of eternal torment. My joining to Christ and his message has never been, nor should it become, simply about my life here. I'm just telling, I'm preaching good this morning, and maybe you're just uncomfortable this morning, but it's okay because we have to realize that God gave me a word a, a few months ago about the fact that uh, I'm standing here getting ready to preach, and the word of the Lord comes to me and says, The the people have been awakened and they stand ready to move. But they need to be given direction. And I sat there and I thought, well, bless God, you just confirmed my message. Praise God. I came up here, preached my pretty little message and went home and thought, God, we had great church. And there was a number of people that were born again that day. And we had National Day of Prayer here on Thursday night. And thank you to all of you that were here. I appreciate you and our presenters. Those of you that are in here, you did a marvelous job. I'm proud to be your pastor. Proud to be a part of this family. But at the end of that prayer service, I had one of you come up to me. And I, don't, I honestly do not know if this individual has ever been used in the gifts, whether the vocal gifts uh, in any way before, or if they have a desire to. But this individual came up to me and began to talk to me about something different. And then I think really there, there was an intention there, but all of a sudden in the spirit got comfortable and was reminded of something. And they said, the Lord gave me a word a few months ago. And I didn't know if it was for the church or if it was for you. And I've been meaning to tell you, and so I want to tell you today. And the word is, the people have been awakened. And I'm going to tell you that your dense, dumb pastor in that moment thought, I think I missed it back there. I think God wanted me to talk about something and I thought I knew what he wanted me to talk about and I just got a revelation that I think I might have missed it. And so this morning what I am trying to do and I am going to finish doing is give you the direction that God would have you to have today. Because I do believe that there is a stirring among the people of God and we're saying, God, I want to do use me, show me where I'm supposed to be, position me how you would have me to be. And there are times we just simply don't know where to step next. So here's your pastor this morning. I'm going to help you. My joining to Christ and his message has never been about simply my life here, but rather my being a believer is about something that supersedes me. 
It supersedes my day and my current context. And it reaches to something that God himself has declared and purposed. My being a believer should never become about a better life filled with the things of this world. It should never be about my life being measured a success by the standards of this world or the amount of happiness that stuff can bring me or having this perfect seeming life here. But rather, I must always allow myself to be reminded that this has always been and always will be about a relationship restored with God and a commission to reach others that they might do the same. It has always been about life transformation and my being conformed to the image of Christ, not me making Christ conform to my image. Is it possible this morning that we are like these two believers, that we might hear the Lord speak to us, calling us fools as he did them? For we say we know him, but we've allowed ourselves to create a different version of Christ within our own lives. We quote the scriptures. We say right things. We, we have good theology but our lives no longer manifest that transformation at, that we experienced at the beginning. There is seemingly a lack of willingness for sacrificial commitment to the cause of the kingdom. The love of Christ has always been about real and true relationship with God, a continual relationship that brings true re transformation in our lives. And yesterday, as I was working over my message, I felt the Lord deal with me specifically about something. And I changed the end of my message for this. As you heard already this morning, we are celebrating this week 47 years of the history and existence of Parkway Apostolic Church. I don't have my beginnings here. I don't have a lot of change in my pocket, really, if you were to say, well, time and tenure breeds influence and brings you, you know, respect and garners you power and authority. I don't have that. But I wonder, having an understanding of the great history that we have, if even with all of this history, that we find ourselves today like these two believers on their way to Emmaus and that something is not complete within us. I want to remind you of some things this morning. This church was founded. It was established as a soul winning, Bible study teaching, disciple making church through which lives were transformed and made new. And I believe that there's a whole bunch of you that could have, in that moment, got as excited about that as you did anything I said before. Because if it was not for what happened as a result of this church, you would be just like me, some dirtbag outside of this place with no hope. No future. Some of you would already be dead. You'd probably be in jail. Your lives would be a complete mess. But because this church was founded as a Bible study teaching, <laughs> disciple-making church, transformation came. Uh, so I say this this morning. Why should we be looking for something different? Why, why should we be looking for a different method? Why should we be looking for a different message or a, a different outcome? Why, sh why would we compare ourselves, whether intentionally or otherwise, to a modern acceptance of what it means to be a believer or to be the church in 2019 and beyond? Why, why should we be concerned with that? You see, we were established and have roots. Ah, help me, God. It'll be over my dead body that the roots of this church 
and the foundation of the message of this church will ever be uprooted and planted in something else. So help me God. The story of these two believers, they walk with the Lord, undoubtedly a day's journey. And they get to the place where they say, it's getting to be night. We should turn in here and abide for the evening. And the Bible says that the Lord would have continued on the road to Emmaus. Well, have a nice day. Nice talking to you guys. See you later. But the Bible says that these two constrained him. In other words, took him by the sleeve and said, no, 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 stay with us. Why don't you stay? Let's have a meal together. Let's fellowship. Let's keep talking. And the Bible says that it was when they sat down to eat and the Lord broke the bread that there's revelation. And they understood who it was that had been walking with them in the way. And you know, like the Lord is, you don't know, like a lot of attention, whoop, gone, out, don't know where he went. Thanks, God gave me a revelation. You know, I, sometimes I think that's how Joseph must have felt. Yep, honored God, the favor of God was with him, and then life blows up. And things are going a little better, and the Lord was with him, and life blows up. Seriously, what is going on? Preparation, process. If only I could figure this out. So... The Bible says that there is this revelation that comes and they make this statement. Did not our hearts burn within us while we talked, while we communed, while we walked in the way? This morning, what is it that we have been called to? What is it we've been called to? Intimate relationship with Christ and the duty the duty, it's a privilege, but it's a duty. The duty of publishing the message of his kingdom everywhere we go. Not where we choose, everywhere we go. We must, this morning, return to our original purpose. We must reach the lost. We must seek and save that which, which was lost. We can no longer try to say, well, this is the, the latest and greatest thing that's happening. This is the direction we're moving in. Please remember, God called us to the kingdom and gave us life that we might fulfill the commission to reach a lost and dying world. So this is where I'm going to get personal, and I'm almost done. So if, if your toes are tender this morning, please tuck your feet up behind you somewhere because pastor's about to come down your row. Who are you teaching a Bible study to? See, one thing you'll learn about me, I don't mind awkward pauses because they ain't awkward to me. So who are you teaching a Bible study to? I'll tell you what, I'll give you a little bit of an out. Maybe you desire a Bible study, but you say, I'm building a relationship with somebody to get them in a Bible study. Awesome. So let me ask the question a different way. Who are you intentionally building a relationship with for the specific purpose of teaching them a Bible study? Who are you praying for God help me reach them that their soul is not lost for eternity I, I told you I'm coming down your road there are days that I am so convicted that I'm doing everything right administratively in my life things are good everything's in order but I've lost my focus. And I can come in contact with people and walk away from them and somehow not care that they're going to hell. Well, actually, let's be honest. I care about everybody. I don't want anybody to go to hell. It's just in the moment I justify my not communicating to them because I say, it's probably not the right place. 
probably not the right time. They probably won't receive it from me, so maybe God will send somebody else to them. God, give me a burden. Let me feel your heart. Move me to the place that I am moved by what moves you. Move me to the place that I realize, God, you came to this world. You died on a cross. Where allowed, you allowed yourself to be put in a tomb. You raised to life again. You sent your spirit to fill me. So I could just scrape through life and say, whew, I made it. I'm here in heaven. Praise God. But will I remember that he paid that terrible price? And because I was fortunate enough to have the revelation that he paid it for me, why wouldn't I have a revelation he paid it for someone else? Why wouldn't I care enough? Why wouldn't I care enough about my family? Oh, and you say, but I've talked to all my family. I have news for you. You have not. You are a part of the family that we know as humans. There's a lot of people we all can talk to. And I'm saying, God, give me an open door. Give me an opportunity. Give me words to speak. Let the, let the moment be right that I can drop seed into their life. There cannot be any more excuses. Oh, by the way, we were supposed to have a guest speaker today, and he's really not feeling well, and so he had to cancel. He'll be coming back, but I think it's God's will that I be talking to you this morning. There can be no more excuses for why we don't share, why we don't propagate the message of the kingdom. Why do I say there's no more excuses? Time is short. I have heard since I was a kid that the Lord's return is nigh at hand. It's coming in my lifetime. I got news for you. I'm 46 years old, and I'm praying to God that if he tarries, I'll get, I don't know, 30, 40 more maybe. I don't know, 40 might be too many, but just because I want to go home. <clears throat> but what am I going to do when, if I have a revelation that I have a whole lot less more time now than I did when I began? His coming is soon. And there are people that are tipping off into eternity each and every day. And they're out of time. You may have more time. They're out of time. But I got excuses. I got excuses. But I say, God, help me be reminded of why you paid the price. Why you redeemed me. Why you commissioned me. I'm going to read to you again that last scripture my last scripture, and it's the first scripture I read to you, and I'm going back to the beginning of my notes. Musicians, you can come. Acts 28, verse 27. For the heart, the understanding, the soul of this people have, has become dull, calloused, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have shut their eyes to the truth. Otherwise... They might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return to me and I would heal them. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe with all my heart that there are a lot of things that we miss out on because we've simply forgotten. And I'm here today to be the reminder. Hopefully I ain't coming across too strong. Hopefully you still feel the love. But I pray to God you feel my burden this morning. I got up the other day, and I looked out my front window. You know, they, they did a program about this church a long time ago. Uh, some of you might remember it was on a show called, I think it was 60 Minutes. And they talked to some of the neighbors around this church. Didn't have a lot of good things to say about us. I got up the other morning and looked out my window. You know, we wave and we say hi, and I've actually talked to them. And I thought, dear God, what in the world is my problem? And I felt this burden just climb right up on my back. I was in Africa of all places. And I was talking to Brother McLean and 
somebody that once attended this church, a good man, who's still attached to this church in a lot of ways, came to my heart. I came home with a burden for him. I think I've said two words to the man. I think it was, I think it was high and by, honestly. It wasn't much more than that. I met him one time. I got a burden that has caused me to weep in prayer. Because I realize that time is short. You see, these two people, they are on their way to Emmaus. And they're rehearsing everything that they knew. But the fire had went out. See, if they really believed, they'd have had a lawn chair and a glass of lemonade or Diet Coke or whatever it is that you want, a bottle of water, and they'd have been propped up outside of that tomb on resurrection morning. If they'd have really believed, they'd have said, pop me some popcorn, because the party's about to start. But they didn't. And I will tell you this this morning, each and every one of us would have probably been doing exactly the same things that they were doing. As a matter of fact, I might say in some ways, we might actually be doing that. Because if I truly believe that he came to seek and to save that which was lost, I might be a little more active. You see, I'm never done in the kingdom. There is space for me. There is space for you. Romans chapter 11, please. I shared this this morning with another group of our leaders this morning, but I said the callings and giftings of God are without repentance. That's the Bible all day, all day long. I'll stand by that. It's truth. But oftentimes what happens with us is we make our mistakes. We get cold in our walk. And then for some reason, we allow ourselves and the enemy to tell us God don't want to use us no more. But God's saying, just come back. If, if you would open your eyes, if you clean out your ears, you would see, you would hear, and you would be saying, God, call me back. And he's saying, if you would, I'd heal you. It reminds me of another scripture. If my people, which are called by my name, oh, how is it that we as the people of God have been afforded so much, yet we allow ourselves to live beneath the proclamation of God, and we barely get by. We come dragging in here Sunday after Sunday, God, I need another touch. When he's called us to be more than conquerors, yeah. how to be able to give the devil a bad day every day. But it's not because he's better than me that I don't get to. It's because I forget who he's declared me to be. I forget what he's declared my purpose to be. There's a song we used to sing, and I think we still probably sing it. And I stole some of the words for a statement this morning. The statement is this. God, let there be a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. The song goes, I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. God's wondering when I'll do something with the hymn I already got. That seems like a hard statement, don't it? But I want to end the game. I want to know that I'm doing a work for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want to know that he looks upon me and he says, that's my servant. I want to know that I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Our message must be his. 
Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest all. Let my message be to all. There is but one door into heaven, and it's Jesus. And this morning we have an understanding that unless you are born again of water and spirit, you don't get in. It's not my statement. That's his word. Therefore, can I be placated? Can I feel okay with, well, they love Jesus. Well, if I love them and I love Jesus... I'll expound the word more perfectly to them. Stand with me this morning. Revelation and salvation are available for each one of us today. I fully anticipate that some of you will come to this altar. Some of you will probably hit the door. Some of you are probably, because I said hit the door, are probably already thinking, ah, if you went to said that, I'd already been out the door. Sorry. Not really. But if you are here today and you've never been baptized the Bible way, you can be today. If you've never repented of your sins, if you've never, if you've never heard that God loves you so much that he desires relationship with you, I want you to know that God loves you so much he desires relationship with you that he came and died and rose again for you to have life everlasting. But it requires on each and every one of our parts an awareness that we are a sinner. Newsflash. You're looking at one of the bigger sinners in front of you, and I ain't talking about somebody standing behind me. This guy right here. Right here. Pastor of this church. Miserable failure. Ugh. I'm ashamed at who I am when I realize who I ought to be, who I can be. But I'll tell you this much. I don't sit down and stop. Somehow I kick myself in my own pants and say, get moving. There's more for you. But it all begins with an awareness that we're sinners, that we fall short, that we need him. Please help me this morning in your own understanding. Hear this statement. We like to say, we hate the sin, but love the person. God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. And somehow, we create space for folks to live in sin. Every individual will stand before God and be judged according to their sin. Or the sin that's been covered by his blood. God won't remove the sin from an individual, judge the sin, and then let the individual off scot-free. We will each be judged. There's a way to escape that. We say, God, I'm a sinner. I need you. Forgive me. I want to live my life for you. I want to serve you. I want to honor you. And I promise you, he forgives you in that moment. There's a baptistry here filled with water. Nothing special, just water. Oak Creek water. Expensive water. Really? Well, it's just water. But the Bible says that we should be baptized calling upon the name of the Lord that our sins might be remitted, that we might be cleansed. The Bible way is to be baptized by full immersion in water, having the name of the Lord Jesus Christ called over you. If that is not how you were baptized, you don't know how you were baptized, there's a good chance you weren't baptized that way. I'm telling you, we'll make space for you today. If you are here today and you desire to have God's Spirit dwelling within you, it's a promise of His Word. He'll fill you with His Spirit and you will begin to speak with other tongues as His Spirit gives you the utterance. That can happen here today. I would ask you today to do me a favor that before you hit those doors and go home, before you have to run out to your appointment or get your lunch, that you would spend time in prayer today.
whether it's at this altar, whether it's in your pew, whether you're kneeling, sitting, or standing, and you would say, God, set my heart ablaze afresh. Consume me with your purpose for my life. I want to be used of you. Help me be committed to you. Open my ears. Open my eyes that I might be healed by you. This altar is open to you this morning and I'm going to ask that you would begin to come. If you do desire to be baptized this morning, there are those that will be on either end of the platform. They'll have tags on. It'll say baptismal attendant. They'll gladly help you and give you instruction. If you desire to be prayed for this morning, please find me. There are other leaders in this church that will pray with you. But do not leave this place the same way you came here today. God is desiring to do a greater work in your life. Find someone. Pray with someone today. The Lord bless you.